Going Down to South Park is proudly brought to you by the Four Finger Discount Network. Boys, looky there. That there's a Rocky Mountain black bear. One of the few remaining of its kind. Isn't it beautiful? My God, it's coming right for us! <laughs> hey, it wasn't coming right for us. It was just sitting there. Shh, not so loud. Now that there's just a technicality. What do you mean? You see, boys, the Democrats have passed a lot of laws trying to stop us from hunting. Democrats piss me off. They say we can't shoot certain animals anymore unless they're posing an immediate threat. Therefore, before we shoot something, we have to say, it's coming right for us. Wow, you're smart, Uncle Jimbo. Jimbo, look. Oh, it's a deer. Looks like about a 46-gauge net. It's coming right for us! Welcome to Going Down to South Park, the podcast where we have ourselves a time. This week we are here to review the third episode of the first season. It is Volcano. I'm Dando. And I am Scuzzlebutt. No, no, I'm actually Guy. <laughs> Sorry. AKA Scuzzlebutt. I, I wish you had Patrick Duffy for our leg. That'd be amazing. Don't, don't we all? We all wish that. Who do you think? Here's a good question for you. Let's, let's go straight to the mailbag. If you could have any celebrity as your leg, who would it be? <laughs> This is one that I've never really considered. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be someone that you'd be willing to converse with and someone that wouldn't be... A, or, or would you want someone that would just shut up and just be there and just be your leg? Or do you want someone who would be able to just... You could hang out with? Look, I'm a big believer in um, you know a bit of self-love and a bit of self-appreciation. And you've got to like the skin that you're in because you're with that person 24 hours a day. So if you're going to have someone as a leg, yeah, it's going to ne- need to be someone that you like having around. Listeners, before uh, we pressed uh, press record and started um, putting this episode down for posterity, uh, Dando and I were talking about, about how much we're enjoying the Disney Plus series Loki, uh, digging mm-hmm. it very much. I have to say that either my leg would have to be either Tom Hiddleston or Owen Wilson, preferably Owen Wilson, I think. I think oh, this would be a good choice because I, if you're going to have any celebrity as a leg, it's going to be somebody that, because I'm so, me personally, I'm so uncool and have very little friends. I feel like I'd want to have a celebrity <laughs> as a leg that people would want to invite to parties so that I could just be like the tag along. So like my leg gets invited to parties and I'm just there because of my leg. Okay, first of all, all this is patently untrue. You've got friends all over Geelong <laughs> and, all, and all over the world. But I'm very uncool. Having Owen Wilson would definitely make you just feel a million times cool because he's just, there's something about the guy where it's, I don't, you, you look at him and you just want to take your pants off. <laughs> That's true. And if you use your leg, you know, you're going to be doing that a fair bit. So, you know, <laughs> and, and I like to think that every time you sort of place a bit of weight on that particular leg, you'd hear, wow. No, I was about to say every time you dropped your pants, he goes, wow. Wow. Ah, or wow. you know, or if you hurt your ankle or something on that uh, on that particular leg, it'd be ow. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So volcano. I really enjoyed this episode. For me, though, I think it's just because it's so relatable. I remember this being the episode that I think made me fall in love with the show because my dad he loves hunting. My dad is basically Jimbo and is without the psychotic. Like he's not. He's not a psycho hunter. My dad just, he likes to hunt. He hunts rabbits and foxes for the farmers and whatnot. Okay. But me personally, me personally, I never was into it. I never enjoyed it. But when I was younger, I used to go with my dad because much like Stan and his uncle Jimbo and this, I just wanted to impress him and make my dad proud of me. But I never really liked it. And then I remember going out with my dad and him wanted me to shoot well, not wanted me to shoot the rabbit I said I'll, I'll shoot I'll have a ch- uh, an attempt to shoot a rabbit and I couldn't do it I was like I don't want to kill shit I, yeah. and then eventually I did I was great at hunting rabbits because that, that I mean it, once you've seen what foxes do do to baby lambs and stuff it's like you can understand why it's important that we hunt foxes because I mean I know you love foxes but once you've seen a fox eat mm-hmm. the bottom half of a, of a lamb's mouth so that it can't cry out so they can eat the rest of it you, you learn to think, okay, maybe foxes sometimes need to be shot. Oh, God, yeah. Look, nature is definitely red in tooth and claw. It's, it's a pretty brutal business. It's, it's not like we're going out and just killing things because we want to kill things. There, there's a reason foxes need to be culled around the farms. Yeah, look, I'm sure there are perfectly good reasons or even justifications for any type of hunting. I mean, I'm the biggest opponent of big game hunting you're ever likely to see. I mean, any time something comes up on my social media feed of like, Hey, here's some fat cat westerner who went to Africa and um, 
shot an elephant. Yes, yeah. or a giraffe or a tiger or whatever. I'm like, okay, well, you should really be kicked off the planet because you're a substandard human being and an embarrassment to the race. They literally shot this elephant just for the sake of a social media photo. Yeah, just for the... It, even worse is when you see someone who's cut off a trunk or something like that and they're holding yeah. it up like, yeah, check it out. It's like... Um, I very much doubt that you kind of stalk through the brush on foot for like three days tracking this beast and, you know, killed it with like a spear or some shit like that. No, you were 300 yards away with a high-powered rider with a scope. Putting that aside, putting the, you know, the moral and ethical and whatever issues of that aside, you do hear about, okay, there are certain areas in, say, Africa or other parts of the world where hunting sort of subsidises the life of not not the lifestyle but the life of various people or there are situations where herds have to be culled or thinned out or something along those lines so there's always a reason or a justification and i think your mileage is going to vary about what you think about that but yeah generally my default is uh yeah don't hunt animals like a dickhead like that if you're hunting it for food and you're doing it in a humane fashion I can I can kind of roll with that. <laughs> you can tell you can probably tell I've been listening to a bit of Joe Rogan here, folks, because <laughs> he talks about that shit a fair bit. But no, I've never hunted myself. Um, my ex-wife's new partner, they live up in uh, in Townsville, and he's ex-army, and he's got like um, he's got a gun room, not just a gun, a gun room, and <laughs> a museum of guns. Yeah, <laughs> he's a, he's a good guy, and I mean he and also a very responsible gun owner and gun user i mean that door is double locked the guns in itself are locked in racks i mean there's no way you're getting to it unless you know (laughs) you've got keys and accommodations and all that shit but i went up once and we actually went out hunting uh feral pigs now i didn't i didn't please tell me you wore like camouflage face paint and shit (laughs) i i didn't unfortunately i would have you know loved to have sort of gone like um you know, like Mac and Predator or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been dope. Just you just get, get cut yourself in mud <laughs> and scared away the pigs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I thought eh, this really ain't for me. But you know, I could appreciate the sort of the effort and the process that uh, that went into it. And again, he was a he was a humane hunter. He wasn't out there for sort of shits and giggles. He wasn't um, he wasn't uh, Jimbo and Ned. Out there, so it's coming right at us. It's like, yeah, we <laughs> <laughs> which we'll get to eventually. Folks. Sorry, we'll eventually get to South Park. But, but basically, the reason that it related it was relatable for me was because a because I wanted to like just make my dad proud. But then I didn't like it. But then I had my best mate Daniel. He loved it, and it was almost like he became my dad's son. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, da- dad would say, "I'm going shooting," and like my dad would take him shooting, and I'd be left at home by myself. <laughs> Oh, man. How'd that make you feel? I mean, were you kind of like, oh, fuck you, Daniel? I felt exactly like Stan in this. I felt like shit, yeah. (laughs) And then you eventually killed something at the end. Spoiler. Yay! (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but I just thought it was really relatable. Just that, but it's the reaction from Stan when uh, Jimbo was kind of saying something on the lines of, you're hysterical, you're you're blabbering. He's like, no, I just don't want to kill things. I just loved the theme of this episode. Would you call it an anti-gun episode? I guess you could call it anti-guns because you had these, I wouldn't say maniacs. They weren't going to kill oh, people. Yeah, they, still had, they still had rules and regulations, but when it came to hunting animals, they didn't really have many morals. No, no. I mean, I, I think the last thing you could uh, think about Jimbo and Ned is that they're sort of aspirational or role models. They're kind of dickheads. Ned, not so much as much as Jimbo. I feel like Jimbo's the instigator and Ned just goes along for the ride. Yeah, and even then, they're not, they're not arseholes, they're dickheads. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're kind of irresponsible in a way. Like they, were gonna, they wanted the kids to drink beer and things like oh, that. Oh, yeah. But, but, but J- Jimbo's more the, ah, oh, you pussies, when Ned, I feel, <laughs> is more like, oh, if you don't want to shoot things, that's fine. But Jimbo's just like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. But <laughs> it was just, it, I thought it was really, really well handled. I love the way at the end too, where they were just like, Shooting's stupid. Let's just go watch cartoons. I oh, love that yeah. ending. Yeah, look, I'm I'm ve- I'm very in the stand camp here. I couldn't shoot a living thing. I I actually I get a real kick out of shooting at targets. I mean, I've done a bit of small ball shooting and a, and again when um, was up visiting uh, my ex and and her new husband, um, got to get his 
I think it was a 30-30, but it was always... Could, yeah. could, we, refer, could we now refer to him as new guy? As new guy? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Up visiting new guy, guy 2.0. <laughs> and... Um, a thirty thirty is a rifle, right? That sounds that that sounds like it. But um, either way, it was a very high powered rifle. We went out to a shooting range and yeah, sort of squeezed off a few of that. And it's like I can see why people do this. It's kind of fun, <laughs> but um, I wouldn't shoot at anything with a pulse unless you know it was a <laughs> unless. <laughs> I just can't imagine you ever killing anything ever. It's just not in you at all. It's not really, no. I mean, I've even reached the stage where I don't like killing insects. Well, mosquitoes I'll definitely kill. But you know, during the summer months, you'll usually have spiders around your house, or maybe I just do because I'm a bit of a slob. But I noticed in my living room at the, uh, during the hotter months, like a big huntsman in the corner of the room, up in the top corner near the, uh, near the ceiling. And normally I'd be like, Aah! and you know, trying to either get it down with a newspaper or a broom or something, and then either squashing or putting in a container and getting outside. Then I thought, you know what? This dude just wants to hang out. You know, he's probably going to eat some flies or other insects. He's probably doing me a favour. I'm not that much of a scaredy cat that I think, oh, this spider's going to crawl into my mouth while I'm asleep one night. So I thought, you know what? Live and live. You stay there, bud, and um, we'll just hang out, do your thing, and... He was there for a, or, or she was there. I think uh, I think it was probably a, a a female huntsman. Who can tell? I wasn't I wasn't looking that closely. But I said, yeah, just do your thing, and was there for a while, and then eventually left. So it was a perfectly nice uh, cohabitation relationship. I was expecting the end of the story to be like you saw it start crawling towards the window, and you were like, but don't go, and it turned <laughs> to you. And lifted one one of its legs as if to say thank you, sir, <laughs> <laughs> and it was on its way. <laughs> oh, that'd be a sweet ending, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would have been yes, but, uh, but but with volcano though. So we had the the anti gun aspect to it and the, the anti hunting, but we also had I would almost call this almost like a parody of disaster films. And I've I've read oh, how okay. sort of a take on Dante's Peak and the film Volcano as well, which mm. Trey and Matt thought were just horrendous films. <laughs> I never saw Volcano. I've seen Dante's Peak, and I remember watching it going, man, you've really got to switch your brain off for this one. So I can appreciate why they wanted to take the piss out of it with this film because it was a very similar time. And I thought they did a really, really good job of it, particularly too with the... Uh, with the propaganda film of the duck and cover. I oh, that's great. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's one thing I really like about uh, about Parker and Stone. When they do sort of piss takes of disaster movies or, you know, Michael Bay action movies or things like The Day After Tomorrow or Independence Day, which I think they, they do a bit of, or they just sort of take the piss out of big budget blockbusters. They say they don't like them, but I think they maybe do admire them on some uh, on some level. Because they basically play them straight, but then put a little South Park twist on them. And that's what makes them really effective. I mean, I think the thing with this with like their movie Team America, that's essentially a Jerry Bruckheimer, Michael Bay action movie, just with the levels of absurdity, you know, pushed up a few notches. Matt Damon, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but essentially, it's a real action movie. I mean, if you played that, if you played that plot straight... It would probably be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I just I completely had forgotten about Team America. That's a film I need to revisit. I haven't watched it in so long. It's one that's kind of dropped off the radar for some reason. Yeah, it has. Yeah, but it's a. <laughs> I think it's very much of its time, but it's also hysterically funny. But yeah, I guarantee you, every single day, at least once. Someone refers to Matt Damon as Matt Damon. Oh, God. <laughs> he must be so pissed off about that. <laughs> Was he, like, supposed to be in the film and then turned him down or something? I don't think so. It's funny because, I mean, George Clooney, we, we mentioned earlier, has... Vo- he voices Sparky the dog, yeah. He voices Sparky the dog in this first season. But he's someone that they take the piss out of in Team America, and they take they, they mm. really name names. I mean, I think Alec Baldwin's the one they really go to town on. But when they're talking about all these lefty sort of celebrities who get very woke and talking about causes and all that kind of business, yeah, they're really like, hey, it's Sean Penn and um, and 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 Matt Damon, and, all, and there's a whole bunch of them. They actually, you know, name him by name. But poor old Matt Damon's really the only one who sort of goes, Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> And why they did that, I have no idea. 
probably because Matt Damon was riding high and looked like he could do no wrong at that stage. I was like, oh, well, let's take this guy down a peg. <laughs> I'm sure he was annoyed, but he would have taken it in his stride. Like I feel like he just would be he'd just laugh about it. He's got like you say, he's got Matt Damon money. He doesn't give a shit. I think he would wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and go, Hey, wait a minute, I'm Matt Damon. What am I complaining yeah. about? What yeah, have I got exactly to Exactly right. Of course he's got something to complain about, he's a human being, but still. <laughs> In regards to the uh, disaster film aspect of this, I read a really interesting uh, quote from Debbie, I don't know, Liebling, I believe her last name is, who was the producer of oh, South yeah. Park at the time that this, uh, that this aired. And she said that the volcano erupting in this episode and erupting near South Park really helped establish the setting that South Park is a place where anything can happen. Mm. I thought that was, that's actually really interesting. It does because you want to set that tone early because, and I guess I think they already have with like aliens probing Cartman and shit like that, but you really don't know what you're going to get with South Park. These We've done three episodes so far and they are all so different. They are very much, but I think this one really establishes that uh, it's got some real weirdness to it. But it's still so clever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very clever and it's very real or genuine. I mean, it feels like a small town and the way that people behave in a small town or anywhere. But then it just throws in absolute strangeness. <laughs> like, yes. Uh, like Scuzzlebutt. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. As uh, Deborah Liebling said, anything can happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and I think this episode really exemplifies that. Salary for an arm and patch it deaf as a leg. <laughs> <laughs> What did you think of the Scuzzlebutt aspect to it? The fact that when he arrives and eventually got shot. I remember that when I first watched it being really upset. Not upset, but like disappointed. I was like, oh, Scuzzlebutt seems like such a nice guy. Oh, yeah. It's a real bummer of an ending, but it's a real, uh, you know, real Parker and Stone kind of fake out. It's like, mm, yeah, we look, we're suckers for a bit of sentimentality as well. But no, we'll pull the rug out from under you real quick. Do you know, Trey and Matt actually have said that they thought that, uh, well, Parker in particular, thought that they're very lucky that they, this aired in 1997. Because they don't think that Comedy Central would have ever have allowed them to air this story after Columbine with the kids putting guns at oh, each other. Oh yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, as he says, back then it was his direct quote. It was just sort of funny, you know, kids just pointing guns at each other, yeah. and now it's just not that funny. It's it's so strange and so terrible. <laughs> you know, how much has happened in the last two decades? I don't think Trey and Matt would even bother wanting to do that now after what's happened. Probably not, no. Or, or they'd, they'd find some kind of workaround to do so. But, uh, yeah, it's, ju it's just too um, sensitive and potentially inflammable a topic to really even go yeah. near. So, why, yeah, why would you? Why risk it? Why put up with the, uh, with the stress and the struggle? It's, what I found interesting was that this episode actually ran a couple of minutes short, which is why we had to fill time with Ned singing Kumbaya. That was just purely designed <laughs> for, fill for filler. As well as the moments where they're announcing the volcano is going to erupt or the mountain is going to erupt, and it was the da da da, and it was the freeze frame for like ten seconds or twenty seconds yeah. or whatever. That was purely designed just to fill in okay. the extra sp the extra time, but it worked well. I thought it fitted the episode perfectly. It's funny; it works as a gag as well. <laughs> What was your favourite moment from the episode, Mr. Davis? Uh, I've got a few uh, down here. One is, <laughs> I just love the way Cartman actually says the name Skazubat. Skazubat. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you do a really good one. Um, I remember I was acting in this play back in the late 90s, and uh, it's when South Park was all the rage. And uh, this young woman was in it, and I used to crack her up by saying Skazubat like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the pick up the pick up line of 1999. It kind of was. Scared <laughs> Seriously though, if you could do a good Cartman impersonation in the late nineties, you're in. Oh, you were. <laughs> you didn't even yeah. have to. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he's not difficult to do. Everyone can kind of do it. <laughs> yeah, but if you can do a really good one, it's great. I mean, did I actually end up putting that thing on um, on the Facebook page? That guy who. He was singing like... Sang the song? Uh, yes, yeah. he did, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forgot what he was singing. It might have been Linkin Park or something, but he was doing it in a really terrific Cartman voice and he was throwing in, you guys, and occasionally squinting his eyes and he's a, he's a bit of a heavy set fella. He actually looked a bit like Cartman. It was fantastic. But I think he's done a whole heap, but... Um, I tried so hard... And gone so far, you guys. Yeah, in the, in the end, yes. In the end, it didn't even matter. Oh, 
Oh, I loved it. That was so funny. <laughs> I really liked when I was mentioning Africa. And then Carver just goes, my mom says there's a lot of black people in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> that means has no bearing on the story at all. It's just a line. It's just- no, but at the same time, you know, when you're a kid and your parents say something like that, you tend to think of it as kind of like, here's a fun fact you might not know, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what's great about it is that Cartman doesn't realise he's even Cartman doesn't realise what he's saying is kind of, it, not kind of is racist but yeah. he's just saying it <laughs> bit of chivvy you guys <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that I um, there were two other things I really enjoyed about this episode one was the um, I like the news guy the news reporter um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a yep. big fan I'm a big fan of Parker and Stone news guys I mean one of my favourite things just to just to say is like um <laughs> Now his time with the weather or something. I just like doing the newsman voice from there. But I think in this one, the guy at the end is saying something about, he refers to hot, nasty lava. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Just crack me up for some reason. But again, I think the MVP of this episode, or maybe most underrated player, has to be Mr. Garrison because he just has some great line deliveries. Is it South Park is saved? (laughs) (laughs) Just no enthusiasm. South Park is saved. (laughs) Always brilliant, but he but someone talking about Scuzzlebutt, he goes, yeah, he has Patrick Duffy for a lag and wheeze baskets. <laughs> <laughs> that that line there, like you said, sort of sums up South Park, doesn't it? It's, yeah. that, that's not, he says it yeah. as if it's normal. Everyone knows who know? Scuzzlebutt is. Don't you know who Scuzzlebutt is? He's got Patrick Duffy for a <laughs> leg and wheeze baskets. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how fun must this show have been to write? Oh, just coming up with the most absurd shit. But people just... Oh, but it's just so funny. There was nothing mm. like it, was there? But also very stressful, I imagine. Because, I mean, isn't there that oh, yeah, special, yeah. like, six days to wear or something? And Yeah. Yeah, you know, they it's, really... It's just, a very stressful job. They really go down to the wire in terms of the writing, the creation, the recording and all that. That's sometimes when you get your best work, though. Because when you get a chance to overanalyze what you're doing, sometimes it can be a, a detriment. Oh, absolutely. I think if you're operating sort of purely on adrenaline and fear, it's like, get it out there, get it out there, get it out there. And I don't know, your unconscious or your subconscious will sort of take over and just start throwing out ideas. It's like, we've got to get something done. How about this? How about this? You know, sometimes it won't work, but I think more often times than not, it will. I also really liked Kenny in this episode. So when Kenny starts doing the um, the Indian fire trick or whatever it is and drinking the <laughs> gas, whoa, look at that little Bastard, go! <laughs> now that is now that is a dirty little bastard. Yeah, I just love Stan. You know, I really want to be. A, I'm a dirty little bastard too. Yeah. <laughs> and then when they blow up all the fish, and Ned says it smells like dead fish in here, and Kenny says something. Oh man, that is nasty. I know. We're, I think we're gonna have to have either starting this episode or starting next one. A what do you think Kenny said? Segment. Yes. <laughs> yes, because it's all kind of <laughs> yes. and clearly it's dirty. But uh, <laughs> yes, let's, let's see if there's a website for. I'm sure there's a website. Let's have a look. Oh, <laughs> what does Kenny say, South Park? It's got to be an. Uh, it's got to be a website with this. Nah, it's too much to go through. I'll try and find something. Maybe in the next episode, I might yeah. mention it. But yeah, you can imagine what Kenny said there. Just a oh yeah. man, that is nasty. <laughs> But what do you think Kenny said? I think we should either open that up to the uh, to the listeners or come up with it ourselves, or both. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a constant source of uh, amusement and delight. Okay, now let's try to get an answer from someone who's not a complete retard. Trivia time. So, trivia, Mr. Davis, what questions have you got for me this week? I've got so many, but uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Let's start with where does Ned ask that Cartman was stationed in Vietnam? Oh, I should know this. Nah, it's lost. All right. I'm probably going to be very insensitive and try to do a nerd voice here. Where are you stationed in Da Nang? Da Nang, that's right. Correct. <laughs> My first question is, what is the name of the mountain? It is Mount Emerson. Yes. was named <laughs> after the real Mount Evans in the Front Range region of the Rocky Mountains in Clear Creek County, Colorado. Ah. Next question for you, Mr. Dando. When Randy gets on the phone, who is he talking to? Ooh, another good question. You've, you've got me again. I don't know. Yeah, the man's name is Frank. Frank, okay. Well, mm. My next question is, what is the name of the mayor's new assistant? <laughs> That's Ted, because Johnson got fired. 
Yes, that is right. <laughs> you, you, you'd love the mayor's assistance. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do very much. Um, speaking of the mayor, uh, the chef is in the mayor's office uh, when we first uh, go into the office. What is he trying to stop the cancellation of? Oh, the Salisbury steak being taken off the menu. It is. <laughs> it's Salisbury steak, D. A sort of throwback to the, I think it was the first episode, where he served Salisbury steak. I believe so. Yeah, my final question is, I've got the answer here in front of me. Oh, yeah, I know what the question is. Yes. <laughs> what, what year was the Duck and Cover film produced? Copyright 1952. Yes, was that your last question? <laughs> uh, no, I was going to ask, what is the name of the family featured in Lava and You? Uh, is it Smith family? Close, but not quite. Stevens family. Stevens. Uh, but yes, I did really, really enjoy that film. That was really good stuff. There's a terrific old documentary from the 1980s called The Atomic Cafe. You could probably find it on YouTube, I think. Mm. But it's sort of, um, I don't know if it's a compilation or it's a bit of an investigation about the old original duck and cover movies from the 1950s where everyone was sort of living in the shadow of the atomic bomb and the Ruskies had one and they might drop one in America. So, you know, they put together these uh, public service announcement films where it's like, watch it happen if the Russians drop a nuclear bomb on your neighbourhood. Here's what you do. Duck and cover. <laughs> and, and they're telling kids to basically hide under the desks in their classroom if they hear the, uh, the siren go off. It's like... Oh, there's a bomb coming. Quick, get under your, get under your desk. That'll save you. <laughs> what? It, it won't? Pay to break it, dear Dana. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a fan of everything we do here at Four Finger Discount, you can show your support by joining the family at patreon.com slash fourfingerdiscount. Here you'll get ad-free early access to all of our shows, Zoom calls with Guy and myself, as well as bonus podcasts such as Tales of Futurama and Guy on Springfield, where we go back and revisit classic episodes from the first 10 seasons. So go ahead and join the family today at patreon.com slash four-finger discount. Alrighty, the original air date for Volcano was August 27th in the year 1997. Oh, good times. Yes, good times, of course. The episode kicks off with Eric... Uh, joining the boys in Jimbo's car, saying goodbye to his mum. They're off to go hunting up in the woods. Very nice of his mum. What did she pack him? I packed you some cheesy poofs and happy tarts. Yes, yes. She's always packing food for for her son. She's always she's like she's like a grandma, isn't she? It's delightful. It's very sweet of her, but at the same time, when you're at that age or any age, <laughs> it is the absolute worst when your mum mothers you conspicuously and. <laughs> And obviously in front of your friends. See, I was never embarrassed by my mum. And I was never embarrassed to like say goodbye to my mum and say I love you and give her a kiss goodbye in front of my friends. It never bothered me. That didn't bother me. I got no problem with that. But um, maybe I should take this up with my shrink. No, no, I think there were... I feel like, Cart- I feel like Cartman's mum would, you know, walk in with a wet cloth and wipe his- and clean his face in front of his friends and stuff like that. That oh, kind yeah, of shit. Sure. I'd be like, no, 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 go away, please. I can, I can handle this myself. Or ask him if he's wiped his bottom properly or something along those lines. God bless her, Margaret Davis never did that. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe I was just um, an insecure sort of young man slash teenager who was kind of like, Mim, step it, hanging out with the guys. We, we get a, um, a good Kenny moment here as well where they all say, oh, maybe your mum can kiss me goodbye. And Kenny says <laughs> something and Jim goes, whoa, that is disgusting. <laughs> that was the yeah. <laughs> That's the why I've written. What do you think Kenny said? Because yes, yes I'd I really love to know some of the things he's getting away with. Jimbo says it's time to get the testosterone flowing because the boys are fighting, one not punching each other. He explains the rules of hunting. Boys, I, I need to get serious for a minute. I want you to understand a few basic rules of hunting since this is your first time. First of all, don't ever walk with your gun unless the safety's on. Second, don't shoot anything that looks human. And third, never spill your beer in the bullet chamber. Uh, Uncle Jimbo, we don't drink beer. You what? Oh, yeah, that's right. I don't think eight-year-old kids drink beer. I like chocolate milk. Well, we'll be doing plenty of drinking on this trip. After all, hunting sober is like fishing sober. They did a good job here of making sure that these guys weren't just gun-crazed maniacs. They still had rules and regulations. They weren't completely ridiculous yeah. yeah they wouldn't walk around with, with the loaded guns unnecessarily just when it came to hunting the animals that side of things they're a bit over the top 
They had a code, which I can appreciate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they can't believe that, or Jimbo in particular can't believe that kids don't drink. They then say, it's going to be, you're going to drive away from civilization. It's going to be great. This was a great visual gag. Up the hill and finish. <laughs> I love also how they said, you know, <laughs> hunting sober is like fishing. <laughs> sober. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I never realized it when I first watched the series. But, for example, when the car's just going up the hill or when the lava's coming in and everything like that and whatnot, they do a great job, even though it's computer animated, to still make it look like it's made with paper. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Everyone who used to always make sh- uh, hang shit on the animation of the show didn't get it. They didn't get that it was designed to look like that. They always mm. just thought, ah, oh, it's just cheap gags, cheap visuals, just a cheap show. But no, it's not. That's not at all. It's they. Yeah. This is how they wanted it to look, and that's why it stands out and makes it so different. Because that's, yeah. everything else tries. Everything else tries too hard to be perfect. Where South Park went the other way, you know. Yeah, yeah, and look, I think you can see the influence of it now. There is, there's so much, uh, or so many animated shows that have like a really primitive looking animated style. I mean, it's not, you know, the lines are a bit sort of blurry and. Uh, yeah, you know, the shapes are a bit rudimentary and all that kind of stuff. Clearly, they put a lot of work into it. I mean, and it looks, of course, different from the way South Park looks. But I think it's had a very distinctive influence on the way uh, animation has been done over the, over the last uh, couple of decades. And to my mind, the way South Park looks, it's almost like the characters in South Park are making their own show. Mm-hmm. It's like Kyle and Stan and Carbon and Kenny all got together and it's like... Uh, nothing to do and the PlayStation's broken. Uh, found all this construction paper. Do you want to make a movie, guys? <laughs> and they sort of, yeah, they make their, they tell their own stories with this, um, in this format. That, well, I don't know. It's a theory. I don't know if it's the best theory, but it's a theory. <laughs> it's one of the charms of the, uh, the original Simpsons episodes, the ones that were hand drawn. We discussed this on, um, on this week's Simpsons podcast, Four Finger Discount, that, it looks very clean now. Actually, we discussed it on a Patreon exclusive review of the Saga mm. of Carl. If you um, if you're wondering where that review can be found, so maybe you become a patron. <laughs> yeah, if you want to hear that review, but it looks very clean cut now. It's very polished, which is good. You know, it look, it's it's very pleasant on the eye. But you miss things like have you ever seen the the Facebook pages or the Instagram pages where it's something like Simpsons faces or things like that, where mm. people have taken screenshots of a character as they're turning their head or whatever, and their face yeah. just looks completely fucked up. You don't get <laughs> that. You don't get that anymore. And and, yeah. pe- and we, people don't point that out because they think it's silly. It's that's the charm of the original Simpsons episodes. Like someone literally had to draw that. <laughs> it is. It is. I, look, I found one the other day, and I'm not sure. I think it was probably a season 13 episode, so that this may render the um, the whole thing invalid. But I put it up on Twitter because I'd, I'd freeze-framed an episode and it was somehow like a full frontal face shot of Nelson. And he had this weird kind of grim- grimace on his face. <laughs> he looked exactly like when um, Leonardo DiCaprio was doing the twist in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You know, when he's sort of pulling that... He's, yes, I'm doing a visual gag yeah, yeah, on yeah. audio here. Great, but he's doing the overbite kind of thing and just pulling a bit of a grimace. I thought, oh my god, he looks exactly like Rick Dalton. <laughs> so I put it up on Twitter. I'll put it up on the um on the Facebook page as well because little moments like that. It's like you wouldn't catch it when it's happening, but if you just if you freeze frame by accident, it's like, oh wow, look at that. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Make sure you guys follow us on Twitter as well at Four Finger Pod for more Guy Davis hilarity, <laughs> occasional hilarity. Yes. The boys are then on off their way to, to, to hunting. Uh, they, they get given the a beer, a gun, and some smokes. And the captain <laughs> says, you know, this takes him back to his time in Nam. Jimbo then points out a beautiful Rocky Mountain black bear. Mm. And we get the first, my God, it's coming right for us. <laughs> and Stan is just traumatized by this, isn't he? <laughs> oh, God. I was quite traumatized by it. Poor bear. <laughs> yeah, a little, it's like a, little, a little baby bear as well. Well, true. Look, bears don't need my sympathy. Much like Matt Damon, bears are doing all right for themselves and they would probably make a meal of me if they had the opportunity. But at the same time, I'm like, uh, bears are cool. They're big and cuddly. Yeah, exactly. Don't shoot them. But yeah, <laughs> they certainly uh, put a few holes in this, uh, in this old Ursa. Jimbo then explains the technicality because the Democrats have passed a lot of anti-hunting laws. So now unless they... Uh, posing an immediate threat, you're not allowed to shoot them. Then we get the deer arriving, pulls out the 46 gauge, <laughs> shoots, shoots the deer. One thing about the, the animation of the animals being shot, it looks so fake 
that it's not as confronting. Yeah, I mean it. It, it conveys that. Oh my god, they're really just blowing a shit ton of holes in these animals. But yeah, you're right. It's it's nowhere near realistic. So yeah, you wouldn't be like oh, they shot Bambi's mum or anything like yeah. that. It's also funny that they're just, you know, absolutely decimating these animals that you think they might be out there to um, either get as a trophy and they're fucking it up beyond all recognition so it won't work as a trophy or or for meat, but they're shooting it so much that they're basically ruining the meat. So, you know, they're just there to kill shit. <laughs> Cartman likes it, however, but Stan just does not like it at all. Then it's time for the rabbit and Cartman starts <laughs> having flashbacks and Stan's, it's now Stan's turn to shoot the rabbit but he just can't do it. At, at this moment here, I've got here, this is where I started having flashbacks because I remember looking at that rabbit going, I can't, I can't do it, man. I, I can't oh, do it. You and I on the same page here, Dando. I've written down here, look, I'm very Stan. I could not shoot a living thing. What's wrong with you? I don't want to shoot the bunny. What the hell are you talking about? You don't want to shoot the bunny. You're babbling. You're not making any sense. You're hysterical. I'm not hysterical. I just don't want to shoot the bunny. No doubt your mind is going to be a tree hugger. Yeah, hippie. Go back to Woodstock if you can't shoot anything. I can shoot you, fat ass. I can shoot you too. I'll kill you. I'll fill you full of lead. Jimbo just cannot comprehend this at all. You know, no, <laughs> no fucking nephew of mine is going to be a tree hugger and Cartman calls him a hippie and everyone just like gangs up and stand because he doesn't want to kill things. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Cartman's very into it. I think they, if they had a bit where, you know, there was a, the buck was charging at them or something, then kick ass. <laughs> I think there's at least one kick ass in here. I think he says kick ass when he gets given the smokes and the beer. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Everything is kick ass. This is when they start threatening each other with guns and we get the first volcano rumbling. And intro to Randy Marsh. The man has arrived yeah! for the first time in the series. Not yet known oh. as Randy Marsh. He's just Randy at this point. We find he out is. who he is in a, in a future episode. But he's at the uh, South Park Center for Seismic Activity. He sees the volcano that's smoking. And I just really loved the uh, the music after he finds out that it's a uh, that it's actually going to be a volcano erupting and it's going to destroy the town. <laughs> then just sips the coffee. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> look! Uh, the further on this um, this uh, particular show goes, not this particular episode, but just the going down to South Park show, mm. you will discover that uh, I have a deep and abiding love for Randy Marsh that almost rivals my love for Homer Simpson. <laughs> I can't get enough of Randy. He just cracks me the fuck up. Um, and I think we're seeing the very, very early, in, well, it's the first in appearance of Randy uh, Randy Marsh, but also the early incarnation of him that he's kind of lazy and incompetent at his job. I mean, you can kind of discern that from what happens here, but he hasn't gone full Randy yet. I think we have to wait a few seasons for that. All the stuff with, you know, like, oh, what? what? Oh, this is America. <laughs> One of my favourite bits of all time. Um, but... Um, just this whole bit here with, yeah, just talking to old Frank, uh, the, the things going up and down, what do you think that means? Uh, then just, oh my God, a volcano <laughs> slips the coffee. <laughs> That's great. I, I can't get enough of Randy. So this was a, a nice introduction to one of my all-time faves. Apparently, the calmness of Randy in this scene was a, a sort of a, a take on a tribute to Parker's dad. Apparently, Parker's oh. dad is, is, has a similar job to what Randy does in this episode, and ah. he... Uh, and this is how he would respond to something like this. He's just always cool, calm, and collected. So that's it's like a tribute to his dad. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, listen, the uh, the little needle is moving. Yeah, it's going back and forth really fast. What does that mean? Uh huh. Uh huh. Hey, let me check. Yeah, it's smoking. Uh huh. Oh, really? Really? Oh my God! A volcano! We come back from commercial and Cartman is unable to cook his weenies, so they pull out the old Indian fire trick. Ned catches on fire. I feel like Ned, with his voice box saying ow, 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 was like, I don't know, this poor guy's like, ow, this ow, ow, ow. ow. Like, it just I felt so bad for the guy, despite the fact that he was on fire. It, just, it, just, it made it even worse, the fact that he, the fucking poor guy has to talk through a voice box to, to vent oh. his pain. This is a very triggering episode for you, Dan. <laughs> Look, I, I was I was less upset by that mainly because I figured, well, I imagined at least that if he didn't have the um, the voice box thing, he'd basically be just saying "ow, ow, 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 ow." <laughs> you know, he's not in a great deal of pain. He's not like "ow." It's more like "ah, ah, ah." Motherfucker's on fire. I'm pretty sure he's in pain. <laughs> well, 
True. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just trying. I'm, I'm trying to get through it, man. He blows the truck up. So Jimbo's laughing at him. The fire ends up blowing the truck up. Ah, oh, god damn it, Ned! Like fucking poor Ned's on fire. <laughs> the, the kids are all shocked by this ordeal, but not uh, Cartman because now he's able to cook his weenies on Ned. <laughs> Chef then pleads with the mayor, as we said earlier, to not stop serving salt so steak. And then we get the call from the uh, the geologist, who she mistakes for the gynecologist. Yes. <laughs> So she tells him to send in the geometrist and Randy shows the graph here. I really loved the way they overdid the music cue. And as I pointed out, it was purely there for filler. But I, I just think it made this scene even funnier. It was, it was just perfect for what they were going for. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy anytime we're in the mayor's office. I'm saying just about every character cracks me up. And that's, that's probably true. But um, I like each of them for different reasons. But I'm always happy when we go to the mayor's office. She's, she's just a terrible politician and a terrible person. The mayor says to call the news station because she's going to use this as a, as said, she's a terrible person. and use it as a way to sort of try and boost her popularity because she's going to go save those kids. Then Jimbo tells the ghost story of Ned's arm. I love this ghost story. I thought it was great. And then, <laughs> and, and then Ned's scary Cartman with it. I thought, oh, it's just... That's just good, wholesome fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. good. Uh, there's nothing like a good scary story or ghost story around a campfire. It's, yeah. <laughs> I've, only ever, I've only had it happen a few times in my life, but when it's happened, I've always like, oh, this is fun. More of this. I just love I just loved that Ned's able to use the loss of his arm as a positive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's reached a stage where it's like, mm, I can parlay this into, yeah. <laughs> I can parlay this into a, into a party trick. Cartman then says that you know he wasn't scared, even though it's clear that he was. And Ned hands uh, some gin to Arthur Jimbo. Now, did you notice here when he reached into the cooler, steam came out because he's still hot from being burnt? <laughs> Good call. Good notice. Good pickup. The kids don't want any alcohol, obviously. So, but then Kenny starts drinking the gas. Look at that little bastard go. I thought it was so <laughs> funny. And this is where, he, where Stan first starts getting jealous of, of, of Kenny. <laughs> Cartman and tells the story of Skazubag. But before he does, however, he also, um, what do they say? Like, oh, oh that, that's, that's a taste like pee. Yeah, Cartman's pee. Hey, you would taste my pee. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's just, you know, all these dr- dumbass seven and eight year old kind of retorts to various insults and slights. They're just, they're, they're so juvenile and so blunt object, but still, I don't know. One step behind. Takes one to no one. Yeah, so I, I know you am, but what am I? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. But enough of that, and back to Skazzlebet. Have you guys ever heard of Skazzlebet? What about Skazzlebet is a creature that lives up on this very mountain and kills anybody who dares climb to the top. Why? Because it loves the taste of blood and likes to add pieces to its deformed body. Deformed how? Well, on his left arm, instead of a hand, he has a hook, a knife. No, a piece of celery. Celery? Yes, and he walks with a limp because one of his legs is missing. And where his leg should be, there's nothing but Patrick Duffy. Patrick Duffy? Damn it, Carmen, that's not scary. What do you mean? Have you ever seen Step by Step? Of course you Ever seen Step by Step? <laughs> <laughs> Which in 2021 is a guy that would probably go over most people's heads because I don't think oh, look, I've seen th- step by step. I think anything related to Patrick Duffy is yeah. You've got to do your research in 2021 because um, I don't know even back around this time it's like mm, I think Patrick Duffy was kind of yesterday's news. Having said that, I mean he was on. Well, the dude was the man from Atlantis in the 1970s. <laughs> he was the star of a, a show called The Man from Atlantis, in which he played the Man from Atlantis. What was the show called? It was called The Man from Atlantis. <laughs> I know, I was just being silly. <laughs> <laughs> that name again, The Man from Atlantis. <laughs> but, you know, he was on Dallas, which was, you know, like the biggest thing on TV for a number of years. And he was on Step by Step and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and he also he also make a cameo appearance in one of my favourite comedies of all time, Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story. Very funny movie. Check it out if you have not. I thought Patrick Duffy just, to me, sounds like a 90s heartthrob from like 90210. <laughs> that's who, when I first watched this episode, that's who I just assumed it was. It just looks like some stupid teen heartthrob from a stupid TV mm. series. 
Well, I think I mean I don't think he was ever like a teen heart throb, but uh, throb throb. But uh, he was a um, I think in the seventies and maybe even into the Dallas stuff. He was kind of like yeah, he's a good looking guy. <laughs> I love to get back to Cartman. I love the way he said, and he weaves baskets and other assorted crafts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so so good. Then, then we get the the mountain rumbles again. I don't know why I like this. Is this to me sound like an, an Aussie term? So like the other day at work, our boss said, "Hey, Dana, when's the Tucker Shop get here? Like the Tucker <laughs> van." And I, I haven't heard that for ages. Like the Tucker van, right? So when he says to Ned here, "Pull out the cancer kazoo," <laughs> I just I, I just loved that slang term for, for for this. I just I just thought, "Pull out the cancer kazoo." I thought it was great. <laughs> it does feel it does feel very Aussie, doesn't it? That kind of yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, well, they call it the Tucker Van, the Tucker Van, Tucker Van. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm. like the the food the food truck, as we would call yeah. it, pop culture. True. <laughs> hey, Dad, watch whip out the old cancer kazoo. Let's do a little song. Boom ya, my lord. Boom ya. Boom ya, my lord. Boom ya. Boom ya, my lord. Boom ya. <laughs> Oh Lord, kumbaya Someone's crying, Lord, kumbaya They don't think Scuzzlebutt is scary, huh? Someone's they crying, see how they Lord, like it when kumbaya. they actually see Scuzzlebutt I'll scare the hell out of them tomorrow Someone's crying, Lord, kumbaya Oh Lord, kumbaya The kids wake up, they don't know where Cartman's gone And Jimbo and Ed are out fishing with Kenny in the USS Fish Killer, by the way. Oh, I didn't notice that. But before then, <laughs> we get Kyle saying, you want to know what I think? <laughs> and he farts. <laughs> and apparently, they wanted this. The, the executives wanted this taken out of the episode because there was no joke there. But Trey and Matt thought, what makes it funny is that there is no retort. It's just a fart, and that's it. What are your thoughts on fart gags? <sighs> no, I'm not big on them, in all honesty. I... No, look, I'm, um, I, could, I think I can count on one hand the number of fart jokes that I've laughed at in my life. Now, this is, you know, when they're in mo- on movies and television. I liked it in the first episode, where he's like, hey, yeah. you farted. But <laughs> yeah. this felt like a forced fart gag and it didn't really work for me. There's nothing worse than a forced fart gag. You know what that <laughs> results in. Having said that, you know, when you're, when you're around your friends and you know, someone just lets one rip, it's, it can be kind of funny. Elliot's new thing now is he's just learned how he can make fart sounds on his arm. It's like the greatest. Oh. It's, like the greatest it's like the greatest form of comedy for him. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I think I was about maybe seven or eight years old when I discovered that thing about you know you put your your hand flat in your armpit and you yep. um, and you flap your arm like a chicken <laughs> and you can make fart sounds. Oh my god! I got that so much mileage out of that. It <laughs> honestly was. <laughs> so so funny but see Elliot right he, I know why he does it I know where he got it from but he doesn't say when he says the word smells he doesn't say smells he says like smells like like smells <laughs> but like so he'll go you get his, his his mouth onto his hand or his arm and go like and go oh smells like, just, <laughs> so like it's fart sound ah oh, smells uh, and that, that's just like he could do that for an hour and never stop laughing he just he loves oh. it so it's, it's the greatest thing ever I'm like kid if that's what gets you through the night. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, enjoy nice. it while you enjoy it while you got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing, though. As a parent now, sometimes Elliot's doing something like he'll say, "Oh, it's the sun's still outside." And I go, "Yeah, yeah, sure, whatever." But I think that's the most interesting thing in his world right now. Mm. Let him enjoy it, you know. Oh, no, God, so now, yeah. so now when he says, "I'm like, you're right, mate. The sun is still out." He's like, "Fuck me." That's fucking incredible. <laughs> like, like that's in, that's in his world. That's amazing. So you gotta not, you know, not put him down don't, for it or not not fob it off. Like treat it like it's a big deal. You know. Yeah. Don't trample on their observations, man. It's the first time they're having them. What a beautiful morning for fishing. There's one. There's a fish right there. <laughs> Got it. Great instincts, boy. Uncle Jimbo, Cartman's missing. Who? The fat kid? Yeah. Ah, hell. I guess we better go look for him. Dad, we gotta cut it short. Fire up to 1220. 
Well, I think that's about the limit for our fishing permit. Mm, man, it smells like dead fish here. Mm, oh man, that is nasty. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a kid as cool as you, Kenny. I'm making you my honorary nephew. Jimbo makes Kenny his honorary uh, nephew, which is uh, pretty sad for Stan. <laughs> oh, absolutely it is. Oh, God. You don't want to be replaced, <laughs> you know, as the object of anyone's, um, as the object of someone's affection. I mean, particularly when it's a relative. It's like, oh, wait a minute, you know, give some of that to me. But, uh, you know, if you clearly, if you don't live up to it, oh, it's painful. We come back from commercial and we got the news report on the pending volcano eruption. The mayor screws up her bit, not realising she's on live TV and does it all again. Mm. <laughs> then she asks, she says for everybody, let's go help those kids. Everyone's out looking for Cartman, or like the, the, the kids and Jimbo and Ned. There's not many animals around and that's because the volcano is about to erupt. Mm. But the, there's a smell coming from the volcano. He blames Ned. Yeah, I got some serious gas. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you can say anything like Ned could say anything and it would sound funny. It would. <laughs> they then shoot the goat. What, what's great about this is that they haven't forgotten why they're there. So they're still carrying around a gun and he'll be like, Jimmo could be mid conversation and then, oh, fuck, bird, bang, shoots the bird. And then just continues on like it's no big deal. Like he's just, oh, yeah. he has to kill something. But then Cartman arrives as the scuzzle butt. What's great about this is when Cartman just goes, <laughs> those guys are totally scared like he's so <laughs> proud of himself you know, like he's, I, I've totally got these guys but no uh, Jimbo and Ned want to kill Scuzzlebutt to get onto the front page of the mm-hmm. what's the, the gun co- book called whatever it is oh damn it I've forgotten yeah whatever it is then we get another news report update and Randy's explaining the trench idea and how it would bypass South Park completely the mayor here that would be good <laughs> uh, I, I, I would think so, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Incredible levels of incompetence or just barely competence in, um, in South Park. It's so great. Well, that's one aspect that South Park kind of copied from The Simpsons was that everyone in a position of power is a moron. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Evil or stupid? Jimbo is then following the tracks, shoots the bird, as I said. Cartman, uh, uh, I had here, why doesn't Cartman just take off the costume? But at least they pointed out that he couldn't get out of it. He was stuck in the costume. He was struggling. Stan was the responsibility of killing Scuzzlebutt. So then you think, oh shit, Stan's going to shoot Cartman. Then we another news update. And this is Officer Barb Brady. It's obvious now that his catchphrase is, all right, people, nothing to see here. <laughs> yeah. That's his thing. <laughs> yeah. He shows them the training video on the uh, duck and cover. Harbingers of sorrow, natural disasters can be the cause of troubling and undesirable stress. And a volcano is no exception. But what should you do if a volcano erupts near you or your family? Here we see the Stevens family enjoying a Sunday picnic. But suddenly, Dada hears a noise. It's a volcano. Junior seems worried. But have no fear, Junior. Jane learned in school what to do when you hear a volcano erupt. That's right, Jane. Duck and cover. So what will you do when you hear a volcano erupting? That's right. Duck and cover. Looks like you got the idea. Duck and cover. Thank you and goodbye. Okay, any questions? That has got to be the most ridiculous load of pig crap I have ever seen. That's enough out of you! Stan is then aiming the gun directly at Cartman and cut... Uh, I've got here cut to commercial, but I guess the last five minutes, there must have been another commercial break or so, because usually there's only two commercial mm. breaks in the 22 minutes, but there was another fade to black here, so they must have snuck one in. Stan, you know, he still can't do it, he still can't shoot him. Jimbo calls him a pansy, and finally Cartman gets the costume off to prove that, you know, he isn't scuzz about he was just trying to scare them. And then we get the, every episode so far, you know what, I've learned a lesson today, <laughs> and Jimbo was about to learn the lesson, but then the volcano erupts before he can actually explain it. And we think it's killed Kenny. Hasn't quite killed him yet. We find out later oh. on. Then they do the duck and cover and they just get burnt to a crisp. I thought that was great. <laughs> Quick, duck and cover. <laughs> and it instantly burns to death. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> it's now the, the, the trench. The funny thing here is the trench is actually blocking them from safety. <laughs> <laughs> because now they can't get across. But it turns out it saves them in the end anyway. But the mayor um, screws up another live cross. She wants to start again. But just before it's all going to go to shit, Scuzzlebutt arrives, weaves a basket out of a tree, and saves them all. 
Did you expect oh. when you watched this the first time for Scuzzlebutt to be nice? I did not. No. <laughs> I thought it was a really good twist. I thought it was lovely because he, he was a real sweetheart. Yeah. Does he actually say, friend? <laughs> yeah, just before he gets shot, yeah. Gives him a bouquet of flowers and everything, yeah. Oh, <laughs> but yeah, just, um, yeah, we get the, um, oh, it's Scuzzlebutt. Yeah, he has Patrick Duffy for a leg and he weighs baskets. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get enough of that. But the lava is going through the trench all the way to Denver and South Park is saved. Kenny returns, but he gets killed. Not just yet, he does return. Mm-hmm. And we get the news report. Chef sings a song, another song I thought you would have enjoyed this, the Hot Lava song. Hot, hot, hot lava. lava. Hot Lava. It's fantastic. <laughs> Mayor then thanks Guzzlebutt for saving the day. And just before they're about to embrace, Stan shoots him. And Jimbo's <laughs> actually annoyed at him for shooting him. Oh, yeah. What was great here was they're like, what do you mean? You've been telling me to shoot things. I shoot something. Now you're angry at me. Make up your fucking mind. Mind, yeah. <laughs> the other thing is, I, I'm not sure if I'm misremembering this, but... The the shot that kills Scuzzlebutt is actually a lot more graphic and a, and a bit it sort is. of and a lot more gruesome than the other um, the shots that have been taken at the other animals. You know, it's like oh man, oh that looks like you know skull and brain tissue and all that kind of stuff. Poor Scuzzlebutt, which you know I imagine if I'm remembering it correctly is a very deliberate decision on the part of Parker and Stone. It's like eh, we've had a few fun games up to up till now, sort of you know pointing out the. Um, dickery of and the dickishness of some hunters but uh you know when you actually pull the trigger on something it can get pretty gruesome 100 percent. and that that's what they because they parker himself has said he's and, and matt they're very anti-hunting they don't like hunting and killing things at all so mm. they wanted to get that message across that you know we've had some funny games like you said but killing things for the sake of just killing things not cool not great no. not what you want ned now sees the folly of guns drops his gun and which accidentally shoots kenny and kills him Stan just, you know, he just wanted Jimbo to be proud of him. But the Jimbo said, you know, you'll always be my nephew. I'll always be proud of you. The kids are just like, you know what? Fucking hunting is stupid, man. I, I don't understand it at all. Let's just go home and watch some cartoons. And that's the end of the episode, which I thought was the, uh, the perfect way to end it. Let's just go watch some cartoons, which is what we're doing <laughs> right now. Uh, but yeah, I, I just a really relatable episode that sounds weird to say because it was so out there and wacky, but the... The theme of it being anti-hunting for many, many viewers is something that I think a lot of people could relate to. We had the introduction of Randy, Jimbo, and Ned in this episode. Each episode, because it's earlier in the series, we're getting new characters introduced each time. But I just I just thought the, the take on disaster movies was done fantastically as well. I just thought, yeah, all around another really solid episode. Absolutely. And look, it's something we've talked about when we talk about The Simpsons and we talk about Seinfeld, when you and Nicola talk about Friends, I imagine. You've got to have that rock-solid foundation of something that people can relate to and understand and have opinions about, and then you can slather all manner of weirdness and, and, and comedy all over the top of it. Do whatever you like, but you've got to have that foundation of like, oh, yeah, I'm sure there was a time that, you know, my dad or my mum preferred another sibling or preferred one of my friends. To me, it seemed like they liked my friend more than they liked me, or uh, I got pressured into doing something I didn't really want to do. So if you've got that, that's what will um, keep people on, um, on for the duration or keep them hooked, I think. Hello, sir. Postman Butters with a special delivery for you. All right, Mr. Davis, we've got some mailbag questions here to wrap up this episode. Send any questions, guys, to southparkmailbag at gmail.com. Southparkmailbag at gmail.com. First one here is from Scott Nolson. He says, which one of the four boys would you most, when you were a kid, would have wanted to invite over for a sleepover? <laughs> um, look, Kenny seems like a nice guy, but probably not. Uh, definitely not Cartman. <laughs> Cartman's the kind of guy who's like, his mum calls your mum. Would you invite yeah. Eric along? It's like, do we have to? <laughs> you know, but you know, there's always parties at that age where it's like, you've got to invite everyone along. It's like, uh, don't really. But he sucks. Uh, and I'm, I'm honestly torn between Stan and Kyle. I think it would probably be Kyle. Yeah, I feel like those characters are very similar at this point. Anyway, it's hard to sort of separate them. But they're just yeah, they're, they're just normal kids in the South Park world. They are yeah. Uh, next question comes from Chris Anderson. He says, "If you were the chef at South Park Elementary, what meal would you make sure was on the menu?" It's funny because while we were talking about Salisbury steak, we've talked about it a bit, and I've heard about it for a very long time. But I looked it up because I don't I'm like. 
it's Salisbury, Salisbury steak what I think it is, and it's basically burger meat, but not in burger form. So it's it's sort of like mince or ground beef with uh, a bit of uh, chopped up onion and gravy. So it's a, it's a bit of a yeah sloppy meaty mess, which I think sloppy mm, joes. Yeah, oh, without the bread. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like you've got a a, um, a levels of devolution from like a nice you know tightly constructed hamburger a sloppy joe is like this has got much struggle integrity it's sort of falling apart and the Salisbury steak is just oh forget it. this is the whole idea of it all from so um just a big pile of meat with uh with gravy and onion from what i understand and other stuff i'm sure um what would i have i don't think you can go too wrong with a good lasagna at a school um at a um, yeah, school it's cafeteria. It's the kids would want to eat, yeah. Yeah. I don't think anyone's anyone's ever unhappy when it's like, hey, we're having lasagna for dinner. Oh, sweet, lasagna. <laughs> and also, from a purely um, organisational point of view, you make a tray of lasagna, you get your, your knife or your slicer or whatever, and it's like, <laughs> that's me cutting it into a grid. You know, so it's like, everyone gets the same amount, put your ladle in, get it out, pop it on a plate, you're done. So... I am going to go with lasagna, Dando. What do you think? What about pizzas? You can't go wrong with pizzas. Pizzas aren't deep fried, at least. So I feel like if you had like pizza day once a week, it gives something for the kids to look forward to. Hey, it's yeah, pizza it, day. Pizza day. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like a, a, a dirty, great uh, deep dish pizza either. It could be a nice sort of thin crust, a nice nugget yeah, crust or, like or something. Pita bread or something. Just pizza day. Yeah. 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 I'll do pizza yeah. day. Final question here from Jackie Hall. Would you let aliens probe you if it meant you got to go into space? If there was a sufficient amount of lube and they didn't <laughs> go too deep, yes. How, how deep is too deep for Mr. Davis? Oh, well, I'd, I'd let him know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's feel this one out, guys. Hey, hey. <laughs> that's, a, that's enough. <laughs> I said deep, not too deep. Jesus deep. Christ. <laughs> All right, guys, that is the mailbag. Thank you so much for tuning in to our review of Volcano. Hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to rate and review us in the iTunes store, one of the best ways to support the show. And if you want to get early access to this show and all the other podcasts we do, just go to patreon.com slash discount. The link's for that in the description of this podcast. Uh, the other shows we do include Four Finger Discount, The Simpsons Show. We do Talking Seinfeld. I do a friend's podcast with my wife and much, much more. Plenty of exclusive podcasts available. Just go to patreon.com slash discount. The next episode, Mr. Davis, do you know what it is? It's one you're going to enjoy. It's Big Gay L. Yeah, it's Big Gay Boot Ride. Oh. Episode four. I cannot wait to go back and revisit this one. That is for sure. But for now, Mr. Davis, any final words for those incredible South Park fans out there? Quick, duck and cover. <laughs>